Hi everybody, my name is Alan. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, there's so much, really, so much opportunity for us, you know, especially now, it seems to me. You know, you look around, really, and you see so much, so much potential for joy, so much potential for combination and collaboration and creativity. And you see so much of that happening. And then you see so much intolerance and separation and all the experiences that separation bring. You see, you know, the wars and the ethnic cleansings and the bombings and the suicide bombings and the the mistreatment of children the hunger of children. And we know that, that now is the time for that disassociation with love, that un, unconnection, that unrealization of who and what we truly are has to be winding to its end. That we as a species have to be more and more in recognition of what we truly are and not be in opposition, not be in destruction of the branch we're sitting on, of this great planet Earth, of the trees and the dolphins and the whales. For, for greed, for craziness, for, for disassociation. And, and when I was thinking of this, you know, I was looking through the paper and seeing so many examples of a, of a certain type of negativity that I know to a large extent so many of us really are sick of it or really hate it in a way. And we have to come together as brothers and sisters and say enough is enough. And I was also thinking of, you know, tonight's guest, Lee Pepping, who I've known a long time, has written this book called Silent Miracles. And, you know, it talks about the miracles of every moment, the miracles of our day-to-day -day lives the miracles we can experience, the joy we could experience as being on this planet together, and how that really is our birthright, and that is really what we need to do. And we, we need to do it. And in our heart, in our, the core of our being, we know because what we, make, what we are made of is all the same. It's all the same love. It's all the same truth. It's all the same joy. It's all the same compassion. It's what throughout history people have called God. And now is the time for us, using all the tools at our disposal, to shine that light, to shine that love. If anyone's experienced it a little, shine what you have and pray for more. And that's true for every one of us. Whatever level of shine we have, shine it and pray for more. And be in recognition that you are the light of the world. You are the love of the world. Any identification you have with anything less than that is less than that. And you are the light of the world. No one religion, no one country, no one height, no one weight, no one sexual preference is any less the light of the world. And again, our guest, 
shines that recognition, shines that realization, shines that prayer. As I said, Lee Pepping, he's a spiritual teacher, he's a healer, he's a minister, he's a visionary. He's dedicated his life to, this, to serving humanity, to serving that recognition, to serving that truth. And this book, Silent Miracles, that he's written, teaches simple and profound ways of having that recognition of living a spiritual life. And there's no excuse for that to not be our prayer anymore. There's no reason, there's no amount of money for us to trash each other, to, for us to trash the planet. Now is our time to shine. We are the light of the world. So, you know, as we normally do, I mean, we have Lee, and then we have two beautiful videos from a dear friend who did actually the opening uh, music on the show, Omishar. We have two beautiful videos of his music videos. And for most of you know, as part of the healing of this planet, as part of bridging heaven and earth's destiny, is to be part of this international art project we got as a vision to just put out to the world to send us, to create and send us new original pieces based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth and the pieces that have come of all sizes, shapes, formats you'll see are extraordinary all ages. Tonight we have a paintings from A.J. Sloan and, and one of the Bridging family crew members, Cameron Childs. He's nine years old and he just kept wanting to, to put a piece in here. And for anybody who's interested, please join us. Go to the website, heaventoearth.com, you'll see it under. You can watch two of the Bridging uh, Art Project shows on either Google or YouTube, they're both there. Join us, join us in, in shining the light of the world. So join me in a short meditation, then we'll have the first Omishar video, and then Lee will be with us in art. So please join me in a short meditation. Thank you. So bo both the videos you'll see tonight were written and performed by Omashar. The first one is Kingdom of Gold. Omashar is just a real bright light. He travels the world through his gift of music and songwriting, just shining the light of the world. So Omashar, Kingdom of Gold, enjoy.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So Omashar really is beautiful, isn't he? And the painting you're seeing uh, in between this incredible piece of art is A.J. Sloan, Let Yourself Receive. And just, you know, I mean, if you've been watching the shows recently, I mean, you just see one different, amazing, just the energy of that love, of that bridging heaven and earth, just how it manifests is so fantastic. So really, if anybody's interested in joining us and collaborating with us, you know, call us, email us. You'll see it on the you know, bottom of the screen or go to the website, heaventoearth.com. So we're here with, with Lee Pepping. Lee, great having you, man. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. You know, we've talked a lot. I mean, you know, Lee and I really, you know, know each other for the last, I don't know, eight or so years. Correct. And we talk all the time. And he gets us, helps get us on in Santa Clarita where he lives. So we talk, you know, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that your life has really been dedicated for a really long time. And, and, yes. But there were certain experiences at a certain point in your life that kind of, <laughs> you know, shifted. That something happened to you, like a near-death experience. Why don't you talk about that? When, you know, something in your life, you had a motion and a movement, and it was like, okay, go this way. Here's what you're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Uh, in 1981, 1980, I was on tour with a group, and we were heading through a Utah, musical group. A musical group. Uh, a band, a country western band, because there's only two kinds of music, country and western, you know. So. I don't, twang, <laughs> a twang it. And uh, we were heading through uh, Utah. We were going up to Canada to do a tour. And I decided I wanted to go to sleep, so I went back in the back of the cab over sleeper. And what happened next was really amazing, and it changed my life forever. Because as they were going down the highway, it was getting towards sundown, and the deers came out of the mountain. The herd of deer came out of the mountain and sat on the highway because it was still warm. And they came barreling down the road and they hit this herd of deer. And the truck flipped over on top of me and crushed me, threw me in the ditch. And they found me a few minutes later and I was pretty much dead at that time. The paramedics came out right away and I'm, I'm not sure what happened. I think they revived me at that time. But I was taken to a hospital in Nephi, Utah. And at that time, I didn't understand what was going on. But what had happened was I had left my body and I had the white light experience. I was traveling through the tunnel and as I traveled through the tunnel I was greeted by several people I had known that had passed on. And I got to this place and it was a beautiful city. It was uh, much, to, much like the one that Betty Eady describes in her book Embraced by the Light. Matter of fact when I read her book I at, was at that point I realized that other people had, had this experience because I never knew that at that time. But as I came up, I was approached by several people, and one of them, I believe, was Jesus. And he said to me, do you want to stay or do you want to go? And I said, I want to go, because I was very fearful. You hear people having these white light experiences where they're not afraid, where they're in complete uh, bliss and ecstasy, and that wasn't the experience for me. I was really kind of caught in my old ideas of, of Roman Catholicism and what heaven would be like and what my experience should be like. So my thoughts were not really in that right place at that time. So immediately I found myself back in my body. That was about three days later. And I woke up in the hospital and it was an, an amazing experience. This is really what, where the change started to take place. Because when I left, Jesus gave me a bundle. And he handed it to me just like a bundle of dirty clothes or a bundle of laundry or something. And I didn't know what it was. And I held it and suddenly I woke in the hospital. And I looked around and what I could see at that time, I didn't realize what I could see, but I could see the light in each person coming, emanating out from them. And it was astounding. And as people would walk by, I was just amazed by it. And this is a small hospital with nine beds and maybe four or five nurses. And the nurse came over to me and said, he's awake, he's awake. So she comes over to me and she starts talking to me. What's your name? What's your date of birth? And I'm answering the questions and I just grab her arm and I go, do you know who you are? Huh? And it just, and she, being a, probably a good Mormon, not that there's anything wrong with any specific religion, right. she was repulsed from that. And she says, oh my God. And she goes and gets the doctor. And the mm -hmm. doctor comes in and starts same questions. What's your name? What's your date of birth? Where are you from? When I was answering the questions, I says, do you know who you are? And he says, what do you mean by that? I says, you are pure light. Uh -huh. You are pure energy. 
And he looked kind of, and he looked at the nurse, and he said, you know you have a brain injury. Right. You're so there I things. was. Right. There I was. I was in a, I, I thought, well, is this really a hallucination? Because it was nothing I ever saw before. And, and I said, but you're just beautiful, and, and you're just shining, and you're pure light, and you're pure energy. And he says, you know, I'm going to have to put that in the doctor's report if you don't stop talking like that. And I, and I said, okay. And the minute I said, okay, I felt the pain back in my body. And it really kind of freaked me out. And that's what I call, that's when I took my detour into hell. Because what I did is I took this beautiful moment of expression mm. that I had experienced, and I started to repress it. And I went home. Because immediately you saw that the society didn't welcome it. I mean, that was the first reaction from the first two people you spoke to about it. I said, buddy, if you want to end up in the psychiatric ward, keep, keep it up. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And it was really terrifying to me because I said, well, maybe I am crazy. Because this certainly doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard of. And up until that time, I dealt a little bit in metaphysics, and I dealt a little bit in this and that. And I thought, well, maybe this is like a hangover from that. Maybe something I read somewhere was implanted psychologically in my brain, and it came up, and it was a nightmare rather than a, than a beautiful dream. And so I started repressing it, so I started using a lot of drugs and alcohol. And within a few months, I left my wife at that time. Beautiful lady, supported me 100%. I just ran away, and I entered a period of darkness for many years. Uh, kept playing music, kept my job, that kind of stuff. But I found myself burning every bridge I could. Mm. I found myself really creating like a hell on earth for myself. And I found myself at odds with everybody and everything. Because I was repressing this beautiful feeling that I had, this feeling of pure energy. And rather than harmonizing with it, I was creating discord. And I was creating just a horrible vibration in my body, which I came to realize later. Meanwhile, I don't know what's going on. So rather than experience it, what I did is I suppressed it and I numbed myself for many years. And finally, I had a, a, a spiritual awakening. Occasionally, I would have, oh, I'd have just something where I'd look at like a flower and suddenly I would see the entire universe in it. And I went, no, that's crazy, that's nuts, hmm. it can't be, it's not, it's not real, that's an hallucination, it, it, it doesn't exist. So occasionally I would go back to these ideas, periodically um, I, would, I would have these experiences, and one of the experiences I had that I'll never forget is I was walking in a bookstore, and I was looking, I was trying to find relief from this agony that I was in. So I thought, well, I'll get some Christian books and I'll go, I'll buy the Bible finally, you know, and I'll, I'll so read it. So this is from... your history and your background. That's correct. That would be the Bible and Jesus and that means of reaching heaven or reaching Right, through salvation. repentance and right, okay. all that kind of Catholicism, which is a wonderful religion and there are beautiful people in it. And I highly respect the people that dedicate their lives to any spiritual pursuit. But what happened was when I walked in the bookstore, I saw this, I was looking at the Bibles and I turned around, of course, the metaphysics and the new age is on the other side of the bookstore, on the other side of the aisle. And I turned around and I noticed this book come out a little bit from the, from the top shelf. I'm you like, seemed to notice motion. It was moving towards you. Exactly. It moved out about an inch or so. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that's pretty funny. So I pushed it back in. And when I took my hand down, it moved back out. Wow. So I went, wow. okay, and I, I, I figured, wow. well, there must be something behind it, so I pushed it back in really hard, and I went to walk away, and it fell off the shelf. Wow. So I said, okay, I, you know, being a good Barnes & Noble's person, being a good Borders person, I'll put it back up. So I went to pick it up, and I looked at it, it said, A Course in Miracles. And I went, you know what, that's exactly what I need was a miracle. And I looked up, and there was nothing on the shelf, nothing in the way. That would create it to move out. It was just an empty shelf. It was beautiful. Wow. So that was my start back. That was my journey. And of course, I opened it up and it says, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. All miracles are the same because all expressions of love are maximal. And I went, what is this? This isn't, you know, this isn't what, what I was taught, you know. And I put it down for a while and I kept hearing like this calling to, to pick it up and read it. And as I started to read it, things started to change for me. And then I finally had another spiritual awakening that was pretty much as dramatic as that first spiritual awakening. And that was, as I was playing music, I was in a, a city in, in Los Angeles that's patrolled by the sheriffs. And as I pulled out of the parking lot after I'd completed my gig there that night, 
I was going down the road minding my own business and suddenly the, the blue lights came on and they pulled me over. So I went, okay, jigs up. And all of a sudden I heard that voice. And the voice wasn't like a voice like you talking to me. The voice was almost like an energy and it said, stick your hands out the window. So I said, okay. So I uh, just looked around. I said, okay, I stuck my hands out the window. And the person who had pulled me over, the gal, the sheriff, walked up to the passenger side. And I've got my hands out the window like this. And I'm feeling really kind of stupid. And yes, I'm like, why would I put my hands out the window? Right. You know, and she says, she knocks on the window with her baton and says, roll the window down. So I said, okay. And I reached over and I rolled the window down across the passenger seat. She says, have you been drinking? And of course, I didn't stop drinking for a long time. Right. So Yeah, for the last <laughs> six or eight months, is that considered <laughs> drinking today? Only had one. Officer? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I, I just said, kept drinking. And for some reason, I said yes, because usually I say, "Oh no," you know. But and that was the third time I'd been pulled over. So I, she said, "Okay, we'll get out of the, out of the truck." So I got out of the truck and I walked around the front of the truck, and I stood in front of her and she asked for my license. And of course, I gave her my license. And immediately, what she did is she put it in her top pocket, and suddenly I felt that that feeling of, this is it. And I suddenly realized that I was surrounded by four sheriffs with their clubs out and their guns drawn. This could be a really bad scene. (laughs) I was thinking, maybe they're going to overreact. But (laughs) if I do something, this could be a very bad scene in a hurry. (laughs) I'm outnumbered. (laughs) So I said the only prayer I've ever said with sincerity, and that was just simply, help me. Uh, and with that prayer, I didn't even say, God, help me. I didn't say, God, please help me. I just said, help me from the bottom of my heart, from the very depths of my soul. And suddenly, that expression of God expanded through me, and I was immediately sober. It was just, it was a miracle. And I just remembered there are no difficulties in miracles. And I went, okay, well, this is the perfect time for a miracle. And as I did the DUI test, so on and so forth, uh, I passed. And I thought, wow. And she says, okay, now get in the truck, never come back here. And I said, okay, no problem. Fair enough. Fair enough. (laughs) Good deal, honey. (laughs) So I got into the truck and I took off. And I went, of course, and I went back the next night because I have a gig there, right? And I heard through the grapevine that with an hour before I had left the parking lot that there was a murder committed. And they were looking for a red Chevy truck with a white camper. And I'm like, Wow. And then I suddenly realized with that feeling that I have. And that's really when my detour out of hell, that was really when I took the key to unlock the gates of hell and start my spiritual path begin right at that moment. And all these times I get these little prompts. I understood in that one moment that it's, it's kind of likened a, uh, like there's a little dot, like a ball of fire in your mind. And this ball of fire extends out to the ethers of the universe and beyond till you have this gigantic sphere with no circumference. And within each of that spheres, within you and me, there's the thinking mind. Most people don't realize they have a thinking mind. Most people think they are stuck into this state and there's nothing they can do to change it. They're afraid, they're covered with fear. And my thought was always, I'm gonna lose something I have or I'm not gonna get what I want the two thieves, the past and the present, and even Jesus. The past and the future. The past and the future, exactly. Because the The present's okay. The present's fine. (laughs) Right. I was a little concerned because if you eliminate the past and the present, we're really screwed here. Well, I'm always in the present. Right. So for (laughs) you, it was there. Go ahead. And even Jesus was crucified between the two thieves. Very metaphysical symbol, the past and the future. And Jesus says, join me now in paradise. In the present. Yes, yes. So that's my, that was the beginning of my spiritual awakening. Great advent of the second coming. Well, of the you know, mind. it's interesting, but a lot of people go through, you know, like a dark night in the soul or some level of, you know, really a crash, really a, a burning. You know, in hell doesn't mean anything, but, you know, a burning of the ego, a burning of, the identity where, you know, what comes out is, 
you know, like the phoenix, the phoenix yeah. of consciousness. And so, I mean, was that hunger a strong way, or was that hunger in you, you know, that this is something I'd like to pursue a little bit? Or did you, you know, we've talked to some people who, like, started, you know, with the Course in Miracles. <laughs> you know, they, they read it 400 times the first three hours, you know, <laughs> and the pages were... You know, or right. other books, or you know, something. Sure, or, or the Vedas or the or, Bible, or Jesus Christ Superstar. We sure. have somebody who watched that movie like a hundred twelve oh, times or something. Oh goodness! You know, you know what? It, you know what happened is it became rather than a fixation or even a desire. What it did is it suddenly became very natural. It became like a a, a state that I wanted to be in. It became like okay. I've had this experience, and of course, during this time, I'm reading different things. I'm going to New Thought. I'm reading like Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, and I'm reading a lot of Charles Fillmore books, and I'm reading like Emmett Fox and all these different books, and I'm going, you know, what did Jesus teach? Jesus taught no salvation at all. All he taught is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here, and it's your job to grasp it, and it's your job to accept it, and it's your job not to try to figure it out, but to naturally grow into it because it's so natural because heaven is truly our home, you know? And we have this detour. We have these thousands, for, thousand forms of fear. We have all these hierarchy of problems. My problem is bigger than yours. Well, your religion doesn't meet my standard. Well, you know, because you teach from this book and I teach from that book, we can never get along, and that's the fear. You know, and it's either you're addicted to this fear or you're able to return to a state as God created you, which is whole, perfect, and complete, you know? And so, I mean, and this led you as the experiences grew and grew in you that not only did you want to have the experience that you wanted to help others have the experience, and that's how the Silent Miracles came to be? Absolutely. Silent Miracles are really an outline of a practice or a theme to work with within your life. You know, it starts out with really asking the hard question, what is your belief of God? Because everything starts with the, the unity of God in yourself. And if you believe that God is a punishing God, God is a vengeful God, God can, you will always have a balance and scales and always be watching what you've done, you're, you're dead in the water. You you're know? starting out in a real deficit. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. So the object is to, matter of fact, if you look at the symbol of justice, it's a woman with blindfolds on, and if you look at the scales she's holding, there's nothing on them. Because it's when all forgiveness, it's the last judgment, it's when you stop judging the last judgment. That's all that that means. So oh, That's beautiful. Yeah. Actually, you know, maybe what we'll do is we'll play the second Omen Sharp video, and then we'll come back and really get into the book. I think people would really like that. Great. Yeah, let's do that. All right, so, <clears throat> so the second video of Omen Shar is, is called Shine On, again, written and performed by Omen Shar. You know, he's just a real bright light. So shine on, Omashar, enjoy.
Hi everybody, welcome back. So that was a beautiful video from Omishar. And the picture you're seeing, another coming from all ages, sizes, was from nine-year-old Cameron Child's Butterfly Love. Uh, you know, he just did it recently and framed it and you know, spent a lot of time on it because I was around when he was doing it. And you know, just an example of somebody wanting to share their heart. So anybody who's interested, just give us a call. So Lee, how, how did you come to you know, know that this book needed to come out of you. That, I mean, I know it's, yeah. Yeah, it's gone through a couple of different iterations. and Absolutely. And I think like anybody, uh, you start with the block of stone. Literally, that's what I started. I had this vision come to me. I kept, it, it, like I say, it's not really like a voice, but it's like this, this desire or this natural feeling. Let's, put it, let's say it's a natural feeling that I needed to do this expression. And I really didn't know how to do it. So what I literally did is took the block of stone like Michelangelo would do, and I just started chipping away everything that didn't look like the book. It was a 90-day project that took me two years. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to give people a basic idea on how to awaken from what I call their sleeping mind. Because that's really where I was before, the, before I had my, my accident. I was really asleep. I thought I was doing the right things. I thought I was being where I was supposed to be. I thought I was a good Catholic. I thought I was, but I didn't really realize the depth of the soul 
And I didn't really realize that, that by ministering to people, by giving them hope and giving them and, and giving them light and giving them expressions of life by affirming truth that what I was doing is not only lifting myself, but I was lifting everyone that I came in contact with. Because in the Course it says, I am the light of the world. That is my only function. That is why I am here. And it says, today we will start to assert the happy things to which you're entitled to. And those happy things are that you're whole, meaning that your body will respond to anything the mind tells it to. That you're complete, that you're complete in your relationship, because there's only really one relationship. There's your relationship with God. And that you are perfect. That perfection really means asking for divine guidance. Now let me start on the first subject about the, the, oh, the wholeness. Uh, there's a story I tell when I teach my class called Spiritual Self Mastery about this grandmother. And this grandmother was fresh out of surgery, and she's sitting in her bay window of her living room. This happened about 50 years ago. This is a documented story. And as she's looking out the window, she sees her grandson pull up, and he says, hey, Grandma, I'm going to use your driveway. I'm going to change the brakes in my car. And, you know, the cars back 50 years ago were much heavier than the cars are today. They were made out of steel. They had frames. So they're two to three times heavier than a lot of cars are today. And he jacks the car up, and he takes the wheel off, and he starts taking the brake linings off. And as he does it, the jack, you know those old-fashioned jacks that you had the tire iron that you jack up, simply popped out. And as it popped out, it landed right on his chest and started crushing the life out of this child, 16, 17 years old. So the grandmother sees this, and the grandmother doesn't think. And what she did is she gets out of the wheelchair, runs over to the car, physically picks up the car so the grandson can get out, drops the car, goes back to the house at a slower pace, sits down in the wheelchair. So when the parents come home, when they come home and they talk to the, to the son that had been hit by this car, they're going, oh my God, we've got to get grandma to the hospital right away. There's got to be something wrong with her. So they get her to the doctor's office and the doctor takes her in and he hears the story and he does a basic examination on old grandma and she's fine. So the doctor comes out, and he's talking to the parents, and they're going, what's wrong with Grandma? There's got to be something wrong. He says, you know, I looked, and I couldn't find anything wrong with her, but I did have one question. And they said, well, well what is that question? He says, I asked her, how high could you have lifted that car if you weren't sick? So this is the power that we're dealing with. This is the, the power of that God presence, that power of your soul that's within you. And as I told that story, a lady in my class who's about 78, very thin, about five foot three, said that same thing happened to me. She said, when I was younger, when I was in my 20s, my boyfriend took his car in and did the same thing, and it fell on his head. The wheel fell on his head, and it was crushing his head against the pavement, and I didn't think. And I picked up that car, and he got out, and I let it go, and I, I didn't even have a sore muscle. So that's the power of thought. That's the power of the mind. That's the power of the God presence within us. And that even, I believe most psychologists, most psychiatrists will even, can even prove for a fact that most of the diseases and the illnesses of the world are traced back to the mind. The disease. Yes, disease, the uncomfort is traced back to the mind. And you know what the happiest thing a hypochondriac can hear, don't you? You're sick. That's right. You celebrate. I'm sick. Oh, my God. This is terrific. <laughs> so that's the power that we're dealing with. And there's an ancient Aramaic prayer that Jesus gave his disciples. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And in my book, I talk about that in depth. Matter of fact, in the book, I talk about what is your concept. First, I say that there's really only two emotions. There's either love or there's either fear. Everything you decide, all your decisions all day long are based in love or based in fear. Most people cannot grasp that simple concept. Most people say, well, I have to be this way because if I'm open, let's say, at my job or if I'm open with this person, my boss at work, if I, you know, I have to keep my, my kind of position, I have to get my stance, it's, it's, a, it's a competition. 
And that's not really what it's about. It's about, as you talk about so many times, and that's what I love about your show, you're talking about the oneness, that expression. And expression means an outpressing of the good from within. And that's what I came to learn. That's what I came to understand. And when I first read that there's two emotions, I went, oh, my God. Because there's a hierarchy. There's a thousand forms of fear. Right. You know, there's a thousand forms that can manifest within you. And we're all very specific in our needs. We're all very specific because in this gigantic allness that I spoke about, there's the thinking mind. But the thinking mind thinks that we're in eachness. We're in separateness. Exactly. We're separate from our source. Matter of fact, in the laws of healing, it says, this is a course in miracles. And we'll review some of the principles that must be understood before any healing, well, before all healing can take place. And the very first thing it says, the separation never happened. And once the belief in the separation not happening, all healing manifests instantaneously because we think of this God as punishing, and that's pretty much what we're taught. We're born into a world where we're dependent on our parents, where our par parents raise us and train us. We become very dependent on our parents, so we, we have this idea, the ego has this idea that everything's outside of us, that love has a return. You know, how many times have maybe a mother told their, their child, if you love me, you would get better grades? Or if you enter into relationships in high school, you know, if you really loved me, you would buy me this or you would do this for me. You know, we got these great romantic, you know, stories of Romeo and Juliet that loved each other, but society wouldn't accept them. And so they both had to kill themselves because they couldn't live with the pain because they loved themselves so much. And that's kind of what the book is about. The book's about expressing that love through you, that first off, God is love, flat out. There's nothing but love. And if God is love, then God is all the attributes of love, which is beauty, which is prosperity, which is health, which is wisdom, which is divine right guidance and divine timing. The second thing we talk about is the, th the thinking mind, that you can make a choice. Three frogs are sitting on a log. Two of them decide to jump off. How many are left? Three. Because yeah. it's only a decision. Decision, right. They haven't done anything yet. Right. So then you make the decision for God. Third theme in there. And then finally, what you look at after you make those decisions, okay, if God is love, and I can change my mind about that, and I learn to t ask God for guidance in all my problems and all my affairs, then what I have to do is, and this is the hard part, this is where people really drop the ball a lot, I have to do self-examination. What are my fears? What am I afraid of? What are my grievances? And a grievance is a complaint. What am I complaining about? Am I complaining about the weather? Am I complaining about my, my job? Am I complaining about my relationships with my wife and my family and my kids? And I have to learn to redirect that because that's wasted energy. That's dissonant energy that tears you. You know, so many people spend their lives and once their children are gone, they're just completely depleted. Oh, what do I have, what do I have to live for? because they've been so obsessed with things outside of them. So what you have to do is you have to learn that, that nothing's outside of you, that it's all within you, and that if you harbor a grievance or a resentment, it manifests in many different ways. And that what you focus on, what your intent is, will keep manifesting over and over and over again. It's like you're getting in this relationship. It's like Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Yeah, it's like, oh, over. here I am again. How did this happen? I woke up with this person. It's the same. It's a serial person. I, they all have, they're all brunettes with, you know, with big feet, you know, or whatever, you know. And <laughs> but, you know, and when you can realize that if you can change your thinking and look at self-examination, and then when you learn that after you do that, if you start to bless yourself, you may be the poorest person on the block. You may have literally nothing, but you can start blessing yourself and saying, you know, I'm grateful today I had a piece of bread. I'm grateful today that I have a house, that I have a roof over my head. And you start blessing. And of course, we learned the great lesson from Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, where they were at a place, and it was a desert place, which in metaphysics represent it was pretty desolate. It was pretty bad. It was a bad situation. And the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, we have no food. And he says, stop right there. And he says, what do you have? And he says, all we, ha all we have is 12 baskets and five fishes. And he said, bring them 
to me. In other words, gather up everything you have and bring it to yourself, examine it. And then what he does is he blesses it. He says he raises his eyes up to the Father, which is the metaphysical idea of raising your consciousness up to the true Father, Mother, God in the mind and blessing everything you have. And then he says, feed them. And they go out and they fed them. They had 12 baskets left over. Same idea. As a matter of fact, there's a story of an evangelistic group that was down in South America. I'm not exactly sure. And they were building a church. They were building a church for their community in a small jungle town. And as they were building a church, people would come out of the jungle and they'd bring supplies or they'd bring bricks or whatever they had to help this church be built. And they said, come back on opening day when we have our first uh, service and we will have a big fiesta. So over the period of three or four months, people came and they, you know, they weren't keeping really track of this. And suddenly it was the grand opening of the, of the church. And all of a sudden, hundreds of people came out of the forest to this little church. And they're like, oh my goodness. And they had this wonderful service. And after the service, they didn't leave. And they're like looking around and they're going, where's the feast? Uh, where's the feast? <laughs> So the guys quickly said, listen, here's what we got to do. We got to get what we can, right. and we'll cook it up, and we'll just slice it really, really thin, okay? Right. It's going to be one of the thinnest. <laughs> get the thin slice expert. We got <laughs> to work this out. <laughs> so what they did is they went in the kitchen. They found a couple of big cans of beans and a couple of flour tortillas, and they got the, the, the ladies in there to start making tortillas with a bag of flour. And suddenly they realized, as they started feeding these people, what they did is they did the same prosperity rules. Jesus, they took what they had and they blessed it and they prayed over it. And it was able to manifest enough food for all those people. And there's stories of Elijah in the Old Testament. There's the story of the uh, children of uh, the Hebrew children as they went into the, to the mm -hmm. desert and the manna that came from heaven. Mm -hmm. And that is a state of consciousness that will always supply your needs no matter what the appearance is. And most people can't get to that level. And that's not the truth of them. That is simply because they're not willing to change their minds. That's what this show is about. That's what my ministry is about. My ministry is to say, listen, you are the light of the world. That is your only function. That is why you are here. Wherever you are, forget what the appearances are. Affirm the truth and your body, your physical body and all things will respond to you in perfect divine order in perfect divine fashion. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So I'd like to do, a, could I do a prayer? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this absolutely. is based on the ancient... Yeah, why Aram don't you just look at that camera? Please. This is based on the ancient Aramaic prayer of Jesus, which is the Lord's Prayer. The first step, he says, is to take a moment and go to your closet, which is really simply calming your mind, like you do in a meditation, Alan, when we start the show. And all we want to do is we want to create the space of healing. So. What I'm going to do is the, the five steps of this, which is the first one is the quiet, the second one is the unity, the third one is the realization of the good, the fourth is the gratitude, and the final is the thanksgiving. So let's just take this moment and just simply know that we are in the perfect place at the perfect time, that in this holy instant I say, steady our feet, Father, Mother, God, for I know that we are one with you. There is no separation. There is only God, the good. And in that good, in that love, I know that I am welcome. For heaven waits on welcome. And in this welcoming moment, I say thank you for this welcome. Thank you for we are here. We are here to lift the entire world tonight. For this is forever the truth of what we are. And in this realization, I realize right now, wherever there is any hostility towards anyone, wherever there is any hurt, wherever there is any domestic abuse, wherever there is any type of fear manifesting, I say, no. I say, God is but love, and so are you. Therefore, I am also. Therefore, Alan is, and you are too. And I say these words, and I know these words do not return to me void. For as I speak my words, I know that I am as God created me. I am one, and in this oneness of the allness, I am expressing the truth of what truly is, and that is you are perfect. You are healed. You are whole. So let's take a moment and just say to anyone anywhere who is carrying any type of weapon, whether they be a soldier in Iraq, whether they be a, a, 
insurgent, whether they be in the streets of LA, whether they be in the streets of New York, whether they're thinking of harming another person in this holy instant, let us just join in unity now and say, put down the weapons. Love is what you are. Love is all you can ever be. You cannot hurt anyone. You are free and you are no longer hurting. Whatever it is that is causing you or creating these fears in you, I ask that they dissipate now into the nothingness of what they are. And in this holy instant, I know that this is true, and for this I am grateful. For this we have joined in this moment. For this we are the truth, we are abundant, we are love, we are joy. And everyone everywhere is truly free in this holy instant. So with this I am grateful, with this I am thankful, as I release this prayer into the laws of God. For I know I am under no laws but God's laws. And with that, together we all say, and so it is, and together we say, Amen. Amen. Wow, that's beautiful. Can you feel the energy lift? Yeah. I can feel the show ending too, so it's a real, it's a real <laughs> powerful. You, and we started the show only two minutes ago, so what you, you knocked we the collapsed, thing off. The we miracle come, collapses collapse time. time. So here we go. <laughs> so again, you know, I mean, really, you know, just thanks, really. So, you know, we're coming to the end of the show where, you know, really, it's an opportunity every minute of every day to shine the light to recognize the love, to recognize the light of the world, to recognize who you really are. And if you want any information on Lee, on Omishar, on the art project, Alan, 805-687-2053, 805-687-2053. And remember, the art project is really, it's open for anybody, anywhere, anytime, and we love you. And come again. Go to the internet, YouTube, Google, we're there. You can watch a lot of the shows. We love you. Good night. God bless you.